Of my soul, I cry. In the depths of my soul, I cry. In the midst of the sea, 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 I cry. Save me, the water is over my head. In the midst of the sea, I cry. In the midst of the sea, I cry. Well, this morning we focus on how do we be grateful in the dark times? How do we say, still I will praise you, Lord? We've even witnessed that over the weekend. And in spite of the events that have taken place in France, we still praise him. Amen? We know that he's in control and we give him all, all honor and glory and power forever. If you're a guest with us, we would encourage you to fill out one of the cards that's in the row in front of you. We promise not to show up at your front door or to call you, we might email you just to say we're glad you're there, but we'd like to have a record of your attendance if you do that to all of our members the same, or as always, respond to your bulletin. Again, as we continue this morning, let's stand and consider the very fact, will we still praise him in the difficult times? Let's stand. Praise God from whom all the blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God from whom all the blessings flow.
you've done, knowing every victory with your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Chapter 8, beginning with verse 28 and going through the end of the chapter. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, 
who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Would you pray with me? God, we come before you this morning and pause now uh, for this communion. God, we come before you thankful, thankful that you are for us and therefore no one that can be against us. Thankful that Jesus Christ went to the cross, died, and intercedes for us. Thankful that you are made us more than conquerors. Thankful that there is absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love that you have for us. God, we know that we live in some troubling times. We know and have seen recently that there is definitely evil in this world. God, we know that there are storms in our lives and many struggling with those even today whether it be health issues, whether it be relationship issues, whether it be just life in general. God, even in the storms, even when life is tough, help us to turn to you, help us to look to you. And God, we praise you right now, especially that you sent your son Christ to this earth and he walked through some of those storms and he lived for 40 days in the wilderness and then was tempted. And he went to the cross and sat in that garden and struggled. And even in the midst of that storm, gave it all up to you. Your will be done. So God, when things get tough, help us to turn to you. And help us to remember the example that Christ gave, even the example of going to the cross. And as we take this bread, as we remember his body that was broken for us, uh, may we examine ourselves and look to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
as we take this cup, this wine, this juice, as we remember the blood that was shed for us on Calvary that flowed, um, we are saddened that Christ had to make that sacrifice, but man, we are so thankful for the hope that we have in him. God, as we go through this life and experience storms, a lot of times we just try to, to handle those on our own and, and, and help us to rid ourselves of that thought. Help us to put our trust in you. Help us to put our hope in you. Our hope in our Savior and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. So we're thankful for this cup as we take it and the blood that flowed and washes us and cleanses us and makes us white and makes us righteous and able to step into your presence because of Jesus and Jesus alone. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Peace of God cover me. 
136, and this will be a responsive reading. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him alone does great to him alone to him who alone does great wonders. Who by his understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth upon the waters? Who made the great lights? The sun to govern the day? The moon and stars to govern the night? He remembered us in our low estate and freed us from our enemies. He gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Let's stand. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will I will learn to walk in 
Let's begin uh, our time of study with a prayer. I want us to pray for the, the folks in Paris and folks who have been affected by that. We've been alluding to that and other struggles like it all morning. And I'm so grateful to Lincoln and the team and, and uh, all of our voices combined as we shared in those songs. Um, but let's, let's just have a special prayer right now for folks in, in France. Holy God, it is um, wearisome to us to turn on the news and hear about one more terrorist attack. And if we're tired of it, you, you must be beyond tired of it because you're holy and we're not. And so we we just come to you asking you to be with the folks in Paris, the, the people that have lost loved ones. We ask you to comfort them. We ask you to be with those who have been injured, the hundreds and hundreds who have been injured. We ask you to provide healing for them. We pray for the government in Paris, in France, the, uh, the police, the military, and all who will be involved in trying to find those who were left alive who were responsible for this. And God, we'll just confess to you our, our conflicting opinions. We are gathered here because we are trying to follow the Prince of Peace, but we feel like war. We are gathered here because we have been forgiven of our sins, but we are come asking for justice. And a part of us wants to pray those Old Testament imprecatory psalms about our enemies. And yet we hear Jesus telling us to love our enemies. And so we confess our confusion. We don't exactly know how to respond or what to think or feel. So we're just going to say, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And you bring justice whatever your justice is. And we pray for insight and clarity so that we would know how to respond. But most of all, we pray for those folks in France right now. Your blessings on them. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, some really great responses uh, to the question I left you with last week. We. We've been looking at a story in Luke chapter 17 in the series called The Other Nine. We're trying to learn how to focus on blessings, not burdens as much. And, and the, this story in, in Luke chapter 17 is about a, a group of men, 10 men who were uh, suffering this terrible disease called leprosy. And they called out to Jesus for mercy. And he told them, go show yourselves to the priests. And on the way to the priests, they were healed. Nine of them never came back to say thank you. Only one did, and he was a Samaritan, one of the lowest on the social ladder if you were an Israelite. He came back to say thank you. So we've been looking at the other nine, trying to figure out what it was about them that made them ungrateful, that made them not come back and say thank you and to praise God for what God had done for him. If we can figure that out, maybe we can avoid doing that, right? And learn how to be more grateful people. So I, I, left, I, I gave you three reasons last week about why they perhaps were ungrateful, but I asked you to come up with some others, and I got some great responses. Let me share three of those with you right now. Here, here's one response that I got from uh, one of our members here. I think one reason they were ungrateful was because 
the only one who returned to give thanks was someone they didn't respect he was a Samaritan if I had been one of the other nine it would have taken a lot of courage to leave my buddies and follow someone we all look down on I thought that was a great response here's another um, the nine had been outcasts for some time when they presented themselves to the priests. they would have been welcomed back into Jewish society and being associated with Jesus could get them kicked out of the synagogue since they would just been welcomed back I think the risk was too high for them to be associated with Jesus in any way the risk of guilt by association was just too high another great comment and then I'll share one more here with you the other uh, I know I'm guilty of praying earnestly uh, for something and then when I am blessed not necessarily taking that attitude of shouting it from the rooftops maybe the other nine felt relief from his healing but then let society influence their decision not to take the time to go back and thank him so somebody taking that really personally looking at them themselves and wondering why they're not as grateful really good comments good responses and I hope we can do more of that going forward um, I think it's important that both you and I think of this part of our Sunday morning worship as a conversation so let's uh, let's let's try to find opportunities to do that going forward and, and keep that conversation going so let's talk some more about gratitude this morning and I mean that it's the season right Thanksgiving uh, in you, you mentioned this last week Lincoln mentioned this last week that he Thanksgiving is his favorite holiday it's mine too um, and probably for some of the same reasons uh, I love Christmas I love the meaning the manger the music and we'll we'll talk about Christmas start talking about Christmas in a few weeks but in some ways Christmas seems compromised by marketers and Thanksgiving seems immune to commercialization the stores cash in on Halloween they cash in on Christmas they cash in on Valentine's Day which is a made-up holiday they cash in they even cash in on Easter but Thanksgiving must have gotten a vaccine because just about the only people that can exploit Thanksgiving are the National Turkey Federation and Pepsi AC <laughs> kind of hard to get about excited about turkeys and antacid I'm sure the advertising folks have their best minds working on it but gratitude just doesn't market all that well there aren't aren't any angles to take no buttons to push tough to manipulate something as virtuous as gratitude still there is something difficult about this season sometimes it's hard to find things to be thankful for for some of us it has been a really really hard 2015 um, some of us have had financial troubles some of our families are really struggling financially others of us are in families that are struggling just to stay together and then some of our families haven't hard to be thankful when there is so much friction in your family I think some of us sort of dread this this holiday season in fact sort of dread Thanksgiving because we're afraid it may be the last one we have with somebody we love and for others of us it's the first Thanksgiving that we've had since someone we lost will not be at the at their place at the table some of us are battling some really serious physical sicknesses we've got some stuff that's just it causes us pain and discomfort and we lose we've lost some capabilities and it's we've just been struggling with it on and on we're tired we're, we're tired of seeing our names in the bulletin we're tired of being on the Barnabas list our prayer list some of us are suffering some emotional struggles uh, our names are not going to be on the prayer list but our struggles are just as real because they're not physical they're emotional they're they're, they're maybe in some ways harder and then some of us have some neurological things going on we're some we or somebody in our family feels like we're missing some things and so we come to church and we, we hope to find some hope we hope to find some comfort but we hear this story in Luke 17 about the ungrateful nine or we hear this verse from first Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18 give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus 
And that seems just a little calloused. Because I think there are times when we want to say, and if I make you uncomfortable with this, I'm just trying to be honest. I think there are times when we want to say, yeah, thanks, God, for nothing. So let's start with a question. Why would a loving God order us, and that's what this is, a command, why would a loving God order us to be thankful even in circumstances that seem to controvert that very possibility? Why would God do that? Why would God say, give thanks in all circumstances? Well, here's something you don't, you're not going to hear very often uh, in a sermon. I think science can help with that answer. Seriously, 2003, two American researchers assigned a group of young people to keep a journal for the things they were grateful for. We're going to call them the grateful group, okay? group of kids assigned to keep a journal of all they're uh, grateful for. They assigned another group to journal about things that annoyed them. Or things that, that, or reasons why they had it better than other people, why they were better off than other people. We're going to call them the gripey group. So you got the, the, the grateful group and the gripey group. Might be just interesting right now for you just to take a second and think about where would I fall? Not, I mean, nor, in normal living, normal life. Are you in the grateful group or the gripey group? Okay. The grateful group showed increases in determination, attention, enthusiasm and energy one of the key findings in the study was that there was an important distinction between being grateful for what you have and simply recognizing that other people were worse off even in the gripey group which focused on people who had it worse than they did they did not show any of the positive effects that that showed up in the grateful group you, you don't get the benefit of gratitude just by realizing you're better off than other people you have to actually be grateful for your own blessings in order to get those benefits that was from a 2003 study done in California in 2012 a Chinese study found that higher levels of gratitude were associated with better sleep lower anxiety and lower rates of depression and then one more 2009 Researchers at the National Institutes of Health studied blood flow in different regions of the brain while subjects thought of things they were grateful for. They found that subjects who showed more gratitude overall had higher levels of activity in the hypothalamus. That's, that's important because that's the part of the brain that controls a huge array of essential bodily functions including eating, drinking, sleeping, and digestion. Also has a huge, a huge influence on your metabolism and stress levels. That National Institute of Health study also showed that feelings of gratitude activated regions of the brain associated with a neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine is the good stuff. Dopamine is the stuff your brain releases when it wants to say, oh, that felt good, do it again. So gratitude sets your brain up physiologically for a virtuous cycle you think of something that makes you grateful your brain releases dopamine the dopamine makes your brain feel good so it starts trying to think of other things for which you are grateful and pretty soon you and your brain are on a dopamine fueled Thanksgiving high I'm looking forward to that so maybe God ordered us to be grateful not because he gets a kick out of it but because we do it's good for us the one who returned to thank god remember the the 10 guys i told you about just a second ago we've studied in the last two weeks the, the 10 guys are healed nine of them don't come back and say thank you the one who comes back to jesus to say, to say thank you got more out of his healing than the other nine it's not so much that god is offended by our ingratitude although i think he is it's it's that these guys missed out on the rest of the blessing by not being grateful gratitude is a way of seeing life in a different light it's a way of telling a different story 
which leaves us with another question. Now, I think we get the idea that gratitude is good for us. We know that, 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 that if I'm grateful, I just feel better. But when everything in your world seems to be falling apart, when it feels like there isn't anything to be thankful for, when you are living a tragedy, how do you do it? How can you be grateful in the middle of a tragedy? How are those folks in Paris this morning going to be grateful? How are they going to ex exercise gratitude? How do you tell a different story when the one you're living, like feels, living in right now feels like a tragedy? We're not going to get that answer by looking at, at these guys in, in Luke 17 here, uh, the, the story of, of the other nine. We're not going to find the answer to that there. We have to look somewhere else. So I want you to go all the way back to the Old Testament with me, middle of the Bible, the book of Psalms, chapter 16. Psalms chapter 16. I think a part of the answer to how to be grateful when times are hard, how to tell a different story with, with gratitude, is found in this chapter. We're going to read it, and uh, then we're going to talk about it, okay? Uh, Psalm chapter 19. I think it's just like 11, or, yeah, 11 verses. Here we go. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him my right hand, with him in my right hand, I will not be shaken. And this part may sound familiar to you. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will, nor will you let your faithful one or your holy one see decay something peter quoted in the first sermon that he ever preached after the resurrection of jesus in acts chapter 2 you make known to me the path of life you will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand so gratitude helps us tell a different story for, for three reasons. And, and, and this is how you and I can tell that different story no matter what's going on in our lives. It helps us tell a different story because it, 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 it invites us to focus on the giver, not the gifts, which is something we talked about briefly last week, focusing on the giver, not the gifts. Look again at verse 2 in this. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Later on, he says, you are my portion. David doesn't start by listing all the blessings in his life. Because let's face it, there are times, are there not, when you would have a hard time listing your blessings because it doesn't feel like you have any. That's not where David starts anyway. David starts by acknowledging the source of all blessings. That insight alone could help us fine-tune our gratitude because typically we think that in order to be really grateful, we got to start by listing or journaling about all of the things we have to be grateful for. That's what all the studies that I cited earlier said to do. Every one of those. I, I read a bunch of studies this past week about gratitude, and they all said the same thing. They all said, gratitude's good for you, so if you want to be more grateful, list all the things you're grateful for. That's what Christian counselors say to do as well. In fact, one Christian psychologist tells his clients to do a gratitude exercise. He says, from the time you wake up to the time you leave your house to go to work or to go to school or to, to go out for the day, there are at least 100 things you can be thankful for. You slept in a bed with a pillow and a blanket under a roof. Your alarm clock helped keep you on schedule. You had electricity to run the alarm, alarm clock and heat your house. You had a refrigerator. 
you had running water, it was clean, it was hot. And he's right about all that. There are so many things we have to be grateful for. But like every other bit of gratitude advice, I think it starts too late in the process. It starts with the blessings. David starts earlier. He will acknowledge all the things he has to be thankful for. David's going to be, David is really good at listing all the things that, we, that, that he's grateful for. We just, in that responsive reading we just did, that's what that is. That, that reading that, that, uh, that Walton led us in a second ago, it's God did this, his love endures forever. And here's another thing God did, and his love endures forever. And here's another thing he's given us, and his love endures forever. It's a long list of things to be grateful for. David goes back before that and says, I'm just thankful for you, God. I acknowledge that you, God, are mine. You are my portion. You are my Lord. Which sounds a lot like the way Jesus began his prayer, our Father who art in heaven. So if you're finding it hard to be grateful because of your circumstances, maybe instead of asking the question, what do I have to be grateful for, you need to ask a different question. Whom do I have to be grateful for? Start with God. Gratitude invites you to tell a different story about what's going on in your life because it starts not with all of your blessings, but with the blesser. It starts with not all of the gifts, but with the giver. Start there. Second, gratitude invites us to tell a different story. It enables us to tell a different story because it highlights the pleasant places in our lives. Look at verse 6. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I think it's really interesting that David would say that. Because if he had wanted to, he could have, he could have told an entirely different story. Imagine if David had appeared on Oprah or Ellen. And, and, and they ask him about, tell us about your life. Here's what he could have said. David could have said, well, Oprah, when Samuel the prophet came to my house to look for the new king, first of all, he went through all my brothers. He didn't even think about me. And, and then when he, when he finally looked at all my brothers, he looked at my father, Jesse, and said, do you have any other sons? And, and my dad said, well, yeah, there's David, but he's a shepherd. I felt so marginalized by that. And then my brothers were off fighting a war. And I just, I went to check on them, okay? I just went to see how they were. And when I got there, there was this giant who came out and he was saying all kind of mean things to Israel. And all I said was, why doesn't somebody go out there and, and give that giant what for? You will not believe the things my brother said to me. They were awful to me. And then I volunteered. I said, okay, if nobody else will, I'll go fight the giant. And you know, the King Saul did not believe in me. He said I was going to die. I felt so marginalized by that. And so I went out and fought the giant. And he said mean things to me too. He cursed me. Well, eventually I, 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 I was able to vanquish him and I became very successful. And then you know what? They, instead of being grateful to me, the king, Saul, tried to kill me. Chased me down for years trying to kill me. And I lost my best friend, Jonathan. Eventually I did become king and then this woman seduced me. Almost ruined my life. And then my whole family just fell apart, Oprah. My son rebelled against me. I lost him. He, he, he was killed. My whole family just, it, it was just, it was such a dysfunctional thing, Oprah. It was an awful, awful life. I had a terrible life. All of those things really happened to David. They all did. But that's not the story David chose to tell about himself. Samuel tells us that story about David, but that's not the story David tells. I don't think David lived in numb denial because there's Psalm 51, my sin is ever before me. David was, was aware of what he had done. He, he, he realized the mistakes he'd made and the things that had happened in his life. But he recognized, too, that there were a lot of good things that had happened in his life. Times when the boundary lines had fallen in pleasant places, and he was thankful for those. Gratitude helps us do that. Gratitude helps us say, well, you know what? Not everything in my life has been bad. There have been some good things. I have a friend 
who has been as faithful to me as anybody I have ever known. He is a recognized expert in his field. Somebody people call when their institutions run out of solutions. Well, here's what they say about him. If he can't help you, nobody can. So he's an expert, respected in his field. He's a leader in his church. He is a devoted husband and father. He is loved by everybody who knows him. If you met him, you would conclude that he probably grew up in a fairly secure home with a mom and dad who, who modeled love and faithfulness, who raised him up to be the confident, loving, capable man that he is today, and you would be wrong. His mom was a good woman, absolutely. But he grew up in an abusive, alcoholic home. He was the first to discover his father dead of a gunshot. And there were some feelings of ambivalence about the father's death. This friend of mine has seen more trouble in the last five years than a lot of us will see in 50. He does not deny the difficulty of his childhood or minimize the tragedy of the last half decade, but he has not allowed his past to determine his future. He has recognized that along with the heartbreak and tragedy, there have been some very pleasant places in his life, some very pleasant things. Many of us in this room grew up in extraordinarily dysfunctional homes, horrible homes. We have emotional scars and aching memories. You could focus on that, but you don't. You are recognizing that while there are some painful things in your past or even in your present, there are also some very happy memories and moments. Some good things happened. The boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places for you, and that's the story you tell. Now, I'm not saying that if you'll just think happy thoughts, everything will be blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven. I'm saying that you don't have to let your past determine your future, nor do you have to let the present define who you are or the good that you have experienced. So, we First thing we want to do is focus on the giver. Gratitude enables us to do that. The second thing we want to do is to recognize that there have been some good things in our lives. No matter what's going on right now, there, there have been some good things. And then here's the last thing, and I think maybe this is the most hopeful thing. David was able to be thankful anyway in the midst of all that, all that had happened in his life because he looked ahead to better times. Verse 6, surely I have a delightful inheritance. In other words, the future is brighter than the past or the present. That's a gratitude strategy that David employed often. You, you've heard this before from Psalm 23. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David is looking ahead in that psalm. He, he's looking ahead to a time. Right now, it sounds like when you read the first part of Psalm 23, he's walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but he realizes that down the road, things are going to be better. Uh, Psalm chapter 48, verse 14, God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide till the end. Psalm 85, verse 12, the Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. We lost something when we moved from an agricultural society to an industrial society, and we lost it even more when we moved from industrial to information. In an agricultural society, you know what the word harvest means, and you know what it entails. You know that you don't get a harvest unless you first prepare the soil and then plant the seed and then wait. You don't plant the seed and harvest. You plant the seed and you wait. You wait for the harvest. David is looking ahead, realizing that the trouble he is in right now is not permanent because a harvest of blessing will come in the future. In our digital age, in our information age, in our electronic age, we expect everything to happen a minute ago. We have forgotten how to wait. 
gratitude helps us realize that, that good things are in the future. Psalm 16, verse 11, the last thing he says is, you will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. David looked ahead. Two things here. He is a man of God. He was a man after God's own heart. God, David knew some things about God that we either forget or haven't yet learned or don't fully believe. David knew that no matter how hard things were for him in the moment, God was going to come through in the future. So David offered what I suppose we could call preemptive gratitude. He thanked God for what God was going to do. But there's a flip side to this. Even though David was a man after God's own heart and knew some things about God that we either forget, haven't heard, or don't yet believe, he lived centuries before Jesus came to the earth and died on the cross and walked out of the tomb. You and I have experienced something David only saw from a distance. Like Moses, who only saw the promised land from the mountaintop, David only prophesied about the empty tomb. If you've been baptized into Jesus Christ, you've participated in it. David had a prophetic hope. You and I, if we're Christians, have a living hope. It may sound kind of crazy. That's, that's Easter talk, right? Right before Thanksgiving and Christmas. But the resurrection of Jesus from the dead changes everything. Because the tomb is empty there is not a single thing in heaven or on earth or under the earth that can separate you or me from the love of God that can prevent us from living with him forever. Not cancer, not death, not Alzheimer's, not dementia, not divorce, not oppression, not Islamic terrorism, not even personal failure. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. He is your portion so yeah sounds a little harsh when Paul says be thankful in all circumstances until you realize there is not a single circumstance that God cannot redeem for his glory and our benefit that's the truth Let's close with a prayer. Let's stand together. And after the prayer, we'll sing. Holy Father, we love you. We pray that we will be grateful anyway, no matter what circumstances we're living in, no matter what we're going through. We pray that we will, first of all, realize that if we have absolutely nothing else, we have you. And an infinite God is all we need. God, we pray that we will be people who look, look at our lives honestly and realize the graces and the mercies and the blessings we have been afforded, how there have been times when the boundary lines fell for us in pleasant places and that we will be grateful for those. But God, right now, we're looking forward. We are saying thank you preemptively because we know that one day there will not be any more pain or sorrow or death or dying. We will live with you forever. We are grateful for this living hope. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need to come, you do that while we sing together. Jesus, you're, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word.
some uh, family news with you here. Uh, second Harvest is coming up. Uh, if you have sacks to return for this year's Second Harvest, please do that by this Wednesday. If you have not picked up your sacks, they are, there are some in the lobby and there are some downstairs, I think, as well. Uh, look around the building. You'll find some. So we're, we're getting close, but we have a few left to pick up. Oh, it's in the adult ed lobby, which is down. Is that here? What do we... Right there is the adult, okay, I don't know where stuff is yet, so that's where it is, all right. Uh, there will be a wedding shower honoring Carolyn Patterson and her fiance, Jake Glombowski, today from 1.30 to 3 p.m. in the Mercy Building. They're registered at Bed, Bath, and Beyond, Target, and Pottery Barn. There is also a wedding shower for Madeline Perry and Jacob Stevens next Sunday, November 22nd from 1.30 to 3 in the Mercy Building. They are registered at Beth, Bed, Bath, and Beyond, Belk, and Pottery Barn. Uh, our teenagers are out of town. No, that's children's ministry. Our teenagers are out of town. They're at a, a youth retreat, and that's none of the announcements. I just read this wrong. Our children's ministry, our children's children's ministry Advent wreaths are available. If you'd like to purchase one of those, uh, they're twelve bucks. Contact Amy Smith to place your order. It's a great thing to use for your kids through the holiday season to help them kind of focus on what matters most. We are in need of Wednesday night teachers for our second and third grade class and the fourth and fifth grade class. Lisa and I taught, what, what age was that? The second and third? We did them all last week, right? Uh, great group of kids. So that would be a good, good group for you to hook up with. Wednesday nights, uh, we need some of those for second, uh, teachers for second and third and fourth and fifth. Also need a, a lead teacher for K through fifth grade and nursery workers on Sunday mornings. If you're willing to help with those, contact Amy. Or if you want to just ask some questions and find out what it involves, contact her. Open mic night this Tuesday, November 17th from 7 to 9 p.m. in the Mercy Building. If you're interested in performing, contact Dave Stewart. If you have a talent or even if you don't, you can contact Dave and be involved in that. One of our missionaries, uh, Kathy Jones DeFrancis, uh, down in Ecuador at Hacienda of Hope, had a baby girl. Her name is Allison, and so we're grateful about that. Keep them in your prayers. Okay, um, you have heard um, about, well, you've seen this before, these uh, celebrity before and after pictures, right, of celebrities with and without makeup. You've seen that before. Let me show you a couple of these. It's, kinda, it's interesting what a little makeup can do. It goes a very long way. That's Angelina Jolie. Uh, looks kind of plain and homely and unattractive, uh, but a little makeup and woo, she's really pretty. Uh, not, not to be one-sided here, uh, ladies, that's, that's actually Brad Pitt, believe it or not. A little makeup goes a long, long way. That looks like a first date to some of you, doesn't it? Okay. All right. Here's one of my favorites, Katherine Heigl. Um, she looks like a mom who's sort of mad right there. A little makeup though, woo, goes a long way. And then I don't like his politics, but I like his acting. There's Alec Baldwin who looks grizzled and unkempt and angry, which I think is how he is, and there he is, <laughs> a lot better. Here's an interesting one, too. That's kind of fascinating. You wouldn't believe what a little makeup will do, though. Just take a look. It's, uh... <laughs> that... <laughs> I'm getting a real look from his wife right now. <laughs> That's what he looks like before he shaves. That's just fascinating. Okay, we're having a little fun with this. Our, our budget is fine. Right now, George is not entirely happy. He's got a little bit of a frown on his face. We are probably about three weeks behind on our budget, and there could be a lot of reasons for that. You may have, maybe you missed a Sunday or two and, and forgot to, to give that uh, makeup you're giving that, that those couple of weeks. It could be that... You haven't yet made giving a part of your regular family budget, which is a thing we'll talk about next year. 
and you just haven't gotten around. You kind of got out of the habit of giving. Maybe that happens. Maybe you forgot a Sunday or two. Maybe there have been some hard times. I don't know. There are a lot of different reasons why people might not give on a regular basis. But we're about three weeks behind. We're not in any kind of trouble. Everything is getting paid. But it would be really, really good if we could end the year and fully fund all of our ministries and get off to a great start, a really solid financial footing start in 2016. So here's what we're going to do. Next, next Sunday, we want to we call that Make Up Sunday. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to do it next week. We'd like for you to do it next week so we can finish up our year in or last you know, four or five weeks of planning and get ready for next year. But if you can do it next week, it would be great. Maybe you got a bonus coming at work. Maybe there's some year-end giving for tax purposes you want to do. Maybe you go go back and check and you go, you know what, we did forget to give a couple of weeks. And so you want to make that up. You can do that any time after the 22nd and until the 31st. We'd be love for you to do it, though, next week if you can. What we'd really like to see happen is for George to go from this to that. That would be good. A little makeup can go a long, long way. Let's stand. We're going to have a closing prayer. Glad you were here today. Let's pray. Dear God, we just want to thank you and just praise you for how much you've blessed us, and especially for how you blessed us with sending your son to save us. And, and thank you for the empty tomb that gives us hope. As we leave here, we just ask that you give us strength, help us to... Help us to be courageous as we go this week and share, share the hope that's in us and share Jesus with others and let others know how they can have that same hope in you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.